Greetings, welcome to our lesson today. We're looking at electrostatics and magnetism. It's a really nice section. A lot of this is going to be revision from grade eight to nine with a couple of extra twists to it. So I'm hoping not too much of this is really new to you. Now remember, electrostatics is the study of static electricity, charges that aren't moving, and magnetism. Well, that's a study of magnets, okay? So what are we actually going to be looking at? Firstly, we're going to spend some time on magnetism. We're going to look at electric fields. We're going to look at how they interact. And then we're going to go on to electrostatics, electric fields, and how they interact, all right? It's a really nice section. Why do you need this, grade teens? Because next year in grade 11, you're going to go, you're going to start talking about the relationship between electrostatics and magnetism and how they actually relate to each other, how we use them in motors for generating electricity, all of that sort of fun stuff. Okay. So, let's look at magnetism. Now, first of all, we need to deal with what is a magnetic field. So, this is the first definition which you need to know. And we say that a magnetic field is a region in space where a magnet, okay, or an object of magnetic material, we'll talk about those in a second, will experience a non-contact magnetic force. Now, this is quite important, grade tens, because by non-contact, they do not need to touch in order for the forces to be there, okay? Now, what is a magnetic material? There are only three things that we consider to be magnetic naturally, okay? And they are the elements iron, cobalt, and nickel. Okay, there are only three elements that are considered magnetic naturally, and that's iron, cobalt, and nickel. Okay, now what that means is that they are the only materials that are naturally magnetic. We can magnetize them, we use them to make magnets, we can put them into alloys, which then make them magnetic. In fact, you can test our beautiful silver coins as to whether they have nickel in them by seeing whether they're magnetic or not. So those are the only three, you must, must learn that. In fact, iron is our most popular one, in that it's the most common one that you find, and iron is what's found in a substance called lodestone. Lodestone is a naturally magnetic stone that we can find on the ground, okay, wherever we go. Now, where do magnetic fields come from? Because they're just there, but we've got to find some sort of explanation for it. And scientists have come up with a concept called a magnetic domain. Now, what a magnetic domain is, Inside our metal, so or our material, so we have our metal. Inside the metal, we all know from atomic structure, which you've done, that we have our atoms, and inside the atoms are our protons and our electrons. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. Now, your protons are moving, but they're relatively stable. The electrons, though, we know are constantly spinning on their own axis, which we know is very important with the orbitals, and then they're moving around the atom at the same time. Now, scientists have decided that what is actually happening is as the electrons move, that movement creates a magnetic field, okay? Creates this magnetic area around it. Inside any metal, there are millions of these tiny little magnets. What happens is, and even with something that's unmagnetized, like my first diagram, is we have groups, so we have sections. So over here, this section over here, that is a section where we have a whole bunch of electrons which are spinning in such a way that their magnetic field points in the same direction. So it creates a domain. Inside the, inside the material, we have a small section where we have a tiny little magnetic field all points in the same direction. When a material is not magnetized, as shown in the diagram, all of these just point in random directions. So you don't get a net 
field. Remember that from vectors. You don't get a nice net field. You don't get them all pointing in the same direction. So if my arrows are pointing north, that's a north, that's a south, that's a north, that's a south. They're all random. And because it's all over the place, they cancel each other out. So it's not magnetized. But either by applying another magnetic field to it, so I take a magnet and if this was a nail, I would rub it over the nail, or by applying electric current on either side of this nail, I can make the domains line up. Now, when we get them to line up and all point in the same direction, this becomes a magnet now because the magnetic field has now all interacted with each other and I get a very distinctive north side and a very distinctive south side. Okay, and the north and the south is simply a way for me to know direction more than anything else. So generally, if it's unmagnetized, the domains go all over the place. If it's magnetized, the domains all fit in one direction. Okay, now, how does that help us? If we now look at permanent magnets, permanent magnets are magnets like the ones I have over here. Okay, I'm hoping you've seen this. This is quite a big permanent magnet. Now, it's a little bit of a misnomer, if I can put that with the little line in the middle. I'll explain that in a second. But if we look at a permanent magnet, permanent magnets always have a magnetic field around them. Permanent magnets that you use all the time are things like fridge magnets. Okay? All the, all the time. Also, with the current trend um, in terms of health bracelets and all of those sort of things, the bracelets people wear on their wrists, they have magnets in them, that's just a permanent magnetic field. Now, with a permanent magnetic field, we like these because we have a definite north side and we have a definite south side. Now, permanent magnets can be all sorts of shapes. Here I have a nice, this is considered a typical bar magnet. It's a nice easy one, the ones we use at school. These are also... These are like bar magnets as well. These are actually very strong magnets. We're going to play with those in a second. And this would be a horseshoe magnet, okay, which we see often. This one's actually a very, very strong horseshoe magnet. We quite like this. We don't use it too much, okay. We also have them in things like compasses, which I'll also deal with in a second. So we have lots of permanent magnets. At home, there's lots of appliances that have permanent magnets. But just as a reminder... Be very careful if you have a very strong magnet. Don't put it near your TV screen because it interferes with your cathode ray tube, okay, if you've got a traditional old type TV. Don't put it near things like your flash disks for your computers or CDs or, well, not normal CDs, um, just your computer. Don't put it near your hard drive of your computer because it can actually do a lot of damage if they're very, very strong. So you don't want to mess around with that. Now, Let's talk about, and we're going to hopefully show you this, okay, so we're going to take you in a second. I'm going to take these two magnets, and we're going to show you attraction and repulsion with these two magnets. Now, we'll see, I'm hoping you can see, we'll do it in a second. These are actually marks, so I know which, pole, which, one, which side's north and which one's south, because they just look the same, unlike this one which they very nicely put a, they actually write north and south, they put a little N on the red side, so I know which is north. This one doesn't have that, but they marked, so I know. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to my desk, and I'm going to show you some repulsion, okay? So hopefully now you can see, if we look very closely, there's a, actually they, they put a little mark on here. You might not be able to see, it's very small. Now what that means is, if I put both these marks together, and I bring my magnet close together. It's, can you see it's moving? Just very gently. Now what that means is I'm bringing close together the same poles. So it actually works really nicely. I, used, I chose these deliberately because they're nice strong. So we do it slowly for you. And there it moves. It doesn't like it. So they're the same pole. If I turn them around, oops, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Okay. So like poles definitely do not attract each other but unlike poles watch here very much they like each other a lot so non-contact force i don't have to make them touch for them to experience the force and this is quite nice because when we do this i can move this magnet wherever i like if i really wanted to 
So what do we get from this? Unlike poles, this way around, attract, like poles, repel, which is really, really, really good. And we use it in a lot of places. Okay, so unlike poles repel and unlike poles attract, that's really, really, really important. What we're going to look at now is we're going to look at magnetic fields because we've spoken about it, we've realized it exists because we get this force of attraction and repulsion, but what does it look like? So I'm going to try and demonstrate it to you in a couple of ways. So the first way we're going to do is I'm going to take my simple bar, my nice big bar magnet, and we're going to put it over here. Now, the only reason why it's inside my plastic sleeve is because I don't really want my iron filings to get stuck to it because then I can never get them off. So simple bar magnets and what I have in my paper shaker is iron filings because iron filings are magnetic. Now, I pour some over and you can already see that they're doing their own little thing. And if I tap it, if you look very closely, I'm just getting them to align nicely they start to form a pattern. Uh, especially on the side here, you can see it really nicely. I think these iron filings are a little shy at the moment. And this magnet's been dropped too many times. In fact, while we're doing this, a good thing to remember is, especially with fridge magnets and stuff, you, they can only be dropped so many times because every time you drop them, you knock one of the domains out of alignment. So if you drop it enough, then the domains will disappear altogether. So that's, it. well, not altogether, but they become unaligned. So that's a real problem. Now, this one's not showing me the, mag the field as much as I'd like. So I'm going to change it to a stronger magnet because we want a magnet that's actually going to show us a much better field. So it's smaller. But please, great sense, it's really important for you to remember that the strength of the magnet is not based on the actual size of the magnet. It's based on what the magnet is made out of. Because we have things like hard magnetic materials and soft magnetic materials. And the, our permanent magnets are hard magnetic materials, but some of them just hold their magnets much better. And the big bar magnets that I have with you are actually from my school, and they tend to get dropped rather often, so they lose their magnetism a little too often for me. But let's look at my little one. This one's going to show it much nicer. In fact, you can already start to see the pattern if you look very closely. Okay is if you look, you can see over here, we get a nice little line pattern over here. Don't worry about the empty space, that's just because of the way I put the iron filings on. But if I tap this one, we start to see a very, very nice distinct pattern, particularly in the middle. And we'll just add a little bit more. We just want to make it a little bit more obvious for you. So there we go. This bar magnet's really painful today. Okay, if you look closely, you can see a nice round pattern here. My iron filings are sticking very nicely over there. And we get such a nice pattern. But this is a really nice strong magnet and it does this all by itself. I don't need to help it, okay? And it makes this beautiful pattern which is always the same, great teens. The shape of this pattern doesn't change. But we've got one more thing we need to add to this because this is great. Okay, we have a magnetic field. This magnetic field gets a magnetic force. But just like anything, this is a vector, which means this field needs to have a direction. Where do we get that direction from? Well, this is a little bit of a convention. I'm going to show you this as well. We use the direction in which a compass would move. Okay, so I'm going to take this away again. Okay, and we're going to replace it with my bar magnet. And now what I'm going to use is these tiny little magnets because I want you to see something. These are, these are baby compasses, which also lose their magnetism a little too often for our liking as well. And at the moment, I'm just trying to see if they, there we go. As they swing, you can see that they start to, that should actually go up there. If I follow this round, so if I follow the direction of my little needles, can you see 
that very closely, it's making the same shape. Okay, that one's not working. It's making the same shape that my iron filings made. Okay, so these swing, they face north and south, and now this has formed the same shape. Now it's quite far out because of where I started, okay, but that's the shape it makes. Now it's very difficult to see on the camera, but what's actually happening is that my magnetic field is pointing from north all the way around to south, and I'll explain that in a second. And if I come over here, I just want you to see that we'll take one that's actually that we know is moving. Look at the field on the ends. They go straight out. That's really important. So it's circular around here and straight out on the ends. So it comes out the magnet and it goes round. Now if I had to put these on the other side of my bar magnet, it'll do exactly the same shape. It doesn't make a difference which side I put these little compasses on. These compasses are great for that. I'm really hoping you guys have now seen that. So what does that mean for us great teens? Well, if we come back to the shape, if we just look at, and this is a type of diagram you really, 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 really need to be able to draw, is we have our north and our bar magnet, okay, and around our bar magnet we've drawn the shape, but the direction of my arrows here, very important. The direction of my arrows from north to south, okay? Remember that with a compass, a compass always points towards north because that's what a compass does. But that, and we say that it's the north pole of the compass that's pointing to north. So if I put a compass here, it's going to be the north pole of the compass is repelled away from the north pole and attracted to the south pole, okay? So really over here, we should have arrows pointing out and we should have arrows pointing in. This is very, very, very important. It's another important thing for you to get. The closer together we draw these field lines, the stronger the magnetic field is at that point, okay? Another thing, magnetic field lines aren't gonna cross. So you can't draw magnetic field lines so they cross each other at right angles or at an angle or whatever. They just don't do that. They'll interact in a different way, but they will not cross. Which brings us to what we would do here. So it's our first question for today. We want to draw the magnetic field lines to represent the following. The magnetic field around two like poles and the magnetic field around two unlike poles. Now I showed you earlier that two like poles are going to repel and I showed you earlier that two like unlike poles will retract. So what does that mean in terms of what their, their um, shape would look like? So let's draw in. Um, We'll do, let's make that my first, okay, that's too high up, but we'll move it now. Okay, let's just move it over here, and we'll make another one. We'll try and make another one. There we go. So here are my two poles. Here's my two magnets, and the first one is two like poles, so let's make it two north poles. Okay, now I want you to think about what's happening. We know that the magnetic field, so let's draw the magnetic field for the first one, will be, well, normally it would be this, okay, and it would do that, and we would have that, and I'm just simplifying it quite a bit, so we have that, okay, and it goes out from north into south, out from north into south, and this one would do exactly the same, okay, so we would have that, but I just told you that our, po that our magnetic fields can't, cannot cross each other. So we need to now consider what's going to happen in the middle, okay? Now these magnetic fields cannot cross, okay? They are going in opposite directions. Okay, they're not going to, it's not a case of one can just smush into the other and off we go, because they can't, which means they will actually disappear a little bit, and what's going to happen is this field line's going to do that, this one's going to go up here, and then we're going to do, they're going to actually, oh, let's make sure it fits nicely, 
starts to do this. They will completely miss each other. So this middle part starts to do that. So we get this big concentration in the middle. In it. Okay, and we end up with an empty space here. Okay, that empty space is because now they're repelled. Because the closer we come, the more that these force, these two fields now get smushed together and they so don't want that, they don't like it, so they'll move away from each other. Okay, the only difference between this and putting two south poles together is the field direction. South poles, you'd point them in. That's the only difference that you'd get here, okay? So that's the first one. What about two unlike poles, okay? So let's just make this page a little longer so we don't, okay, there we go. And let's make another one of these so that we've got two that are the same. Here we go. Now, two unlike poles means I'm going to put a north pole to here. That would be south. This would be a south pole. That would be a north pole. Now, remember, they're going to be attracted to each other. So what's actually going to happen here, it's actually really nice, is the, electric, the magnetic field sorry, is going to go from north to south. It's going to be very happy. And it does this, and then it does this, and then it does this. And these now interact with each other. Okay, so we create another, almost like another bar magnet in the middle here. Okay, so we get this field where it's going to go from north to south. Okay, and they join each other because instead of now repelling, they're quite happy and they'll actually join together, which is really nice. It makes life a lot easier for us. Okay, so... Why is this important? Because of where we use magnets and where we see magnetism. Now, the first one is with compasses. And I actually have a very simple compass. This is one we use at school. I personally don't ever have to use one. I'm quite grateful because my sense of direction is quite sad on most days. It's why I have a Garmin in my car. But a compass is used for finding direction. A compass really is a very simple device. The needle in the middle is simply a magnet which is allowed to move freely. And it interacts with this Earth's magnetic field. Okay, and shows us direction based on the Earth's magnetic field, which is really, really nice and obviously very, very important for most of us. Okay, now we get to the concept of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, you guys need to wrap your head around this one. First of all, we get two things called, we have one which is known as geographic north and another that's magnetic north. Geographic north and magnetic north are 11 and a half degrees out from each other, okay? And geographic north is a little bit to the right of, of magnetic north. But, now think about what I'm saying to you. My magnet, the north pole of a magnet, of a compass, points to the north pole of the Earth. Now, does that make sense? Because I've told you that if I put two north poles together, they're going to repel. But now I'm saying to you that this north pole of my compass will point towards the north pole of the Earth. What that actually means for us is that the top, what we consider magnetic north, is actually more like a south pole than anything else. Scientists don't really know why the Earth has a magnetic field, okay? But it's actually really important for us, and I'll, show, I'll explain that in a second as well. It's got to do with the, the core of the Earth and all sorts of things, so we don't need to worry too much about it, but it's there. It means, though, that we have this magnetic field around the Earth. Why do we need it? Well, the first one is the magnetosphere. This magnetosphere, and this is a beautiful picture showing it, okay? And that this, what's on the right, that's the Earth with, it, with this magnetosphere around it. There's the tiny little duct in the middle. The sun 
gives off what we call solar flares. Okay, remember the sun is a huge nuclear explosion happening over and over again. And it gives off these solar, solar flares, which is lots of heat and ionized particles and all sorts of things. Our magnetosphere, the fact that we have this magnetic field protects us from the dangers of those particles and the ions and everything else that comes out from the sun. So we're very, very, very grateful that it's there. Another application, and this is probably one of the most beautiful ones, is the aurora. Now we get these in the north and the southern hemispheres, only in the poles. I personally would love to see one of these one day. What this is, is when the iron po ionized particles from the solar flares hit our atmosphere, they get spread out and they interact with our magnetic, in, uh, magnetic field and they create these beautiful colored lights in the sky. Now this is in Alaska, so this is, southern, this is northern hemisphere, and it's generally green or blue, sometimes a little bit of orange or red, but you can only see them there because of the way the earth is tilted and its, and its distance from the sun. Okay, so it's actually a really beautiful application of it. Now, we're going to take a quick break because we're finished with magnetism, and when we come back, I'm going to look at electrostatics in more detail. Welcome back, and now we move on to electros electrostatics. I particularly really like this section. We need to do a little bit of revision, which is going to sound a little bit like chemistry, but that's okay. We need to remember that inside any atom, there are only two types of charges. Okay, number one, we have our positive charges, which is carried by our protons, and if we had to draw a really simple diagram of our atom remember we have our nucleus in the middle with all our little protons in it and then around the nucleus we have our electrons okay which then move around the electrons when it comes to getting a positive charge this is really important i need you to get this great sense we only get a positive charge on an object because the object has lost electrons okay we never ever ever talk about protons moving because they can't remember our protons are stuck inside the nucleus they are not going to move the electrons are the little ones that move around all over the place they have lots of energy they're constantly moving they are able to be removed Okay, and because we can take them away, if we take, and this is, again, going back to chemistry, if we take ne electrons away from, a from an atom, it becomes a positively charged atom, okay? So that's how an object gets a positive charge, because it loses electrons, it loses its negatives, okay? Second thing we have is our negative charge, which is obviously carried by electrons, and if something becomes negatively charged, it's because it's gained electrons. This is a two-way process, great tens. You cannot have one, two objects, if they interact with each other, they can't both become negatively charged if we charge in them, okay? One will give electrons, one will take electrons. That's just the way it works. They work together. How do we get charged objects? There's two ways. Now, the first way I know you guys have seen and I'm pretty sure you guys have all done this at some stage, is by rubbing. Now, this is a little bit of a project for you to do at home. I'm not going to do it because my hair would be really great for this one, but it'll just be embarrassing if my hair sticks up for the rest of the show, is you take a nice plastic ruler, you rub it really, really fast for a long time, and then you go put it near some small pieces of paper. It's not going to work great in our studio. Our studio is a little too much moisture in the air at the moment. It needs to be a really nice, hot, dry day for it to work really, really nicely, okay? It's also why in Joburg in particular, with our winters, I'm sure the ladies have noticed this at times when you take a jersey off and next thing you hear all the crackling and then your hair stands on end. Can you get very annoyed? It's because of friction, okay? What's happening is when we rub the object, we're getting a transfer of electrons, okay? We'll just explain in a second. Also, and I know you've done this, I know teenagers, okay? Mine at school tell me, yes, no, they've definitely done this. You go around the house, 
you rub your feet on the carpet and then you go touch your little brother or sister and you just love the fact that they get a shock and they scream okay because that's what we do to our baby brothers and sisters you've all seen this okay so that's by friction and what's happening is when I rub the cloth on my ruler the electrons get enough energy that they can move and they go from either the cloth to the ruler or the ruler to the cloth doesn't really matter and then they get charged okay same when you rub your feet on the carpet it's friction you're allowing electrons to move and in fact you're gaining electrons from the carpet and then when you touch your baby brother or sister the electrons are allowed to move so you're creating your own mini lightning okay Friction is a really, really easy way to charge something. So that's by rubbing, okay? The easiest way. Second way is induction. Now, induction's a little more difficult. We're not going to spend too much time on it it's because it's not one of those things you need to spend a lot of time on. But induction really means if I take a charged object. Now, I'm going to say here I have the what is a very simple diagram of an electroscope, okay? Which is just an, a, a piece of equipment we use to show charge in the lab. There's my electroscope. I bring, let's p say I bring a negatively charged perspex ruler towards it. And what happens is the electrons that normally sit at the top of my electroscope go, ooh, don't like those electrons, don't like them and it moves down, they move down to the bottom, which leaves the top of my electroscope positively charged, okay? If I then earth my electroscope, and what that means is I touch it, and we show that, that's the symbol for earthing, I earth it. By earthing it, we now the earth now becomes the thing that tries to neutralize the system. So the earth goes, hang on, wait, mm, too many electrons. It sees this as an entire system, the whole thing as a whole, and goes, oh, don't like this situation. So it goes, okay, no, doesn't give it electrons, I lie. Goes, too many electrons, that means I've got to take electrons away. The only way electrons can go away is for them to leave off the electroscope. So electrons leave the electroscope, okay? Because now we're trying to get the whole system to neutral till eventually it thinks, okay, everything's fine. And then you take your hand away, okay? So now you take your hand away, or whatever you used to earth it, and you take the charged object away. And what that does is the electroscope now gets left, and its little gold leaf will be standing up. It's now left with an overall positive charge. Now, I've charged it without any friction. Well, it's through induction because I charged, however, I charged the rod, but now this electroscope has a charge, but I never had to rub anything, okay? Because I've allowed the earth to do the charging, it's a good way to think of it, all right, is I've allowed the earth to take or gain electrons. The process is reversed if this was a positive rod. So if I put a positive rod here, instead of taking electrons away from the system, it would add electrons to the system, okay? And by adding electrons to the system, my electroscope becomes negatively charged. It's just another form of charging, all right? It's not as important as the friction. The friction is a much more important one that, you that you're able to explain. And in fact, that brings me, right before we get there, sorry, I do apologize, is we now need to look at like and unlike um, charges. Now, do yourselves a favor and go onto a website called FET, all right? Spend some time there. There's a really nice simulation with balloons and it shows like and unlike charges being repelled and attracted, and it's actually really fun to just play with. With it, you can rub the balloon, and the balloon gains the charge. So it's all charging by friction. It really is lots of fun. So do yourselves a favor and go and look at that. But why do we have it? Because like magnets, unlike charges or unlike poles are attracted to each other. Like charges or like poles repel. 
drawn very, very simple diagrams, okay? So if we have unlike charge as a positively charged object and a negatively charged object brought close to each other, okay, then they are going to be attracted to each other, okay? Great, great, great. If they're the same, they will repel. They don't have to touch at all. They're just going to move. They have to be in the vicinity. So what I'm also telling you is this electrostatic force, that's what we call it. It's an electrostatic force, okay, is just like our magnetic fields and magnetic force in that it is a non-contact force. Does not have to be in contact with each other for it to experience the force. If they are in contact with each other, it makes the force really, really strong. And you see that with ionic bonding. Okay, it's why ionic solids like salt are so strong. Because when you're breaking up a salt particle, you're actually breaking up this electrostatic force. Okay, why am I telling you all of this? Because you've got to see the connection between your chemistry and your physics. Okay, like charges attract. Unlike charges, repel. Okay, very, very, very important. So where does that bring us? Because we've looked at repulsion, attraction, all the rest of it. We now need to talk about conservation of charge. You guys have done conservation of charge before. You really, really have. It's the same as conservation of energy in that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but simply transferred to another form. Charge is the same. All right, there's only a certain amount of charge in the world. We just move it around. Before we get to the conservation, though, we need to talk about the arrangement of charge. I often tell my learners that electrons are like teenagers. They're very much like their own space, okay? And charge is like that. So if I have a charged object, and here I have two different shaped charged objects, they will always arrange themselves on the outside of the object. Because if they get to the outside of the object, they're as far away from each other as they can possibly get. And that's what they want. Because remember, they're repelled from each other. Okay? Now, on the one that's more like an egg shape on its side, it's all sitting on the outside. And for, scientists can't explain this one, though, is it tends to bunch up at the ends where, there's, where it comes to a point. They don't really know why that is, but it does. But it arranges itself really evenly. This is such a good thing for us. What this means is, and I actually have seen this done, is if you take a tin can, a nice big old coffee tin, and you charge it, and you put a metal ball straight down the middle on a, on a very fine like um, fishing gut wire, so it's very, very fine, that ball, that metal ball will sit right in the middle. If it doesn't touch any of the sides, it's not affected by the charge because the charge on that tin when it's charged sits on the outside, okay? As soon as that metal ball touches any side of the, of the tin, then the charge moves and we've got a different problem. It's one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why if you're in a car, you're actually quite safe if the car gets struck by lightning, as long as you're not touching any of the metal, metal sides. Because if the car gains a charge, that charge is going to sit on the outside of the car, not on the inside. So anyone touching the outside of the car could have a bit of a problem, okay? But inside, you're quite fine, so you'd have to just charge it somehow first. So you're not, which is quite nice. It's the same as, I'm sure you've seen in movies where they have power lines fall onto a car and there's charge going all over the place and you see the lightning and all of that sort of thing. The person in the car can actually be quite safe because the charge is sitting on the outside of the car because it's like a big tin can in a lot of ways, okay? But this natural inclination for charge to do this, to move and become completely evenly distributed is really important for the conservation of charge, okay? Definition that you need to learn. Charge cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred, okay? So we can only move it. 
And that gets us to a very important equation, which says to us that if I take my, my new, if I take two objects and I put them together, the charge will get transferred over those two objects so that it's evenly distributed. What do I mean by that? Let's take, I have a sphere and I have another one. Now, this sphere, I'm going to put four little eight electrons on and let's say this has got an overall charge of minus four and remember, charge is measured in. Coulombs. We're going to get back to that in a second. And on this, on my other one, I'm going to put 6. So that has minus 6. Now, both of these two spheres together have a total of minus 10. We allow them to touch. Okay. The charge can't now distinguish that one, well, I've still got my one object and here's my other object, we're just touching, so we're just going to sit like this. It can't. When they touch in, the charge sees this, this as one object now, completely one object. What does it do? It distributes itself evenly. So the charge does this. We still have a total of minus 10. But if you look carefully, this one, has only five now, and that one has five. When I now separate it, the charge also can't go, oh, hang on, wait, I want to go back to where I started, because oh, I'm happy, I'm, I'm not, I was separated, um, doesn't really matter. You know, they're very bl blase about it. So what happens is once we separate them again, this one's now got a minus five, that one's minus five, still minus 10 in total. If we look at the equation, which I said to you, says that my new charge is one charge plus the other one divided by 10, I had minus four, sorry, minus divided by two, and minus six. So minus four minus six gives me minus 10. That's gonna divide minus five, which is what I saw. So we're quite happy with that. Okay, so this equation simply tells me that if I take two charged objects, two charged spheres, and I touch them together and then separate them, the, this charge gets nicely distributed between both. So it makes it nice and simple for us, okay? But let's remember another important concept here, okay? Charge is measured in coulombs. I'm going to come back to the top one. These unit conversions over here, so, so, so important. One coulomb of charge in relation to what we're doing is huge, great tens. It is ginormous. We don't do that. When we talk about point charges and we do problems and stuff, we really are talking about putting charges on an object the size of a pinhead tiny, tiny, tiny objects. So this is micro coulombs and this is nano coulombs. Very important. One micro coulomb is one times 10 to the minus six micro coulombs. One nano coulomb, one times 10 to the minus nine coulombs. Going to be using very, very small, small charges. That brings us to the quantization that's a big word, which I can't really pronounce, of charge. What this means, charge comes in, in discrete packets, only in certain values. This is one of, when, we, when you were doing the history of the atom, we did a little bit of, of Rutherford and the experiments to find electrons. This is one of the things they found. In fact, a very important man called Millikan is the man who discovered that charge is quantized. And that means that you can only find it in multiples of a certain number, and that multiple is 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. That means on an electron, so if we're looking at the charge on the electron, it's minus 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. The charge on a proton is 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. An electron is negative, a proton is positive. Okay, 
same value though, 1 comma 6 times 10 to the minus 19. The equation, which got a little hidden there, that says Q equals N Q E. N is the number of, it could be electrons or protons, okay? So if it's a positive charge, then it's the number of protons we're using. If it's a negative charge, then it's the number of electrons we're using. But that's the number. So if we have 7,000, I'm going to go 7,000 times 1, 6 times 10 to the minus 19. QE is a constant. On your information sheets, grade 10s, you are going to be given QE in terms of electrons. You are going to be told that the charge of an electron is minus 1, 6 times 10 to the minus 19. You're not going to be told the charge of a proton. You need to know that protons and electrons have the same charge, just opposite sign. Okay, so an electron is negative, a proton is positive. Very important for you to get that. Okay, you're getting this sort of in the back of your head. You know, lots of detail we're going through at the moment. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break now, and then when we get back, the last segment, we're going to look at a whole bunch of questions, and we're going to try and bring all of this together for you. Welcome back, and we're now looking at some questions. We're very excited. We're going to go right back to the solar electrostatics, and first question, very typical type question, it says you're given a perspex rod right, and a piece of cloth, so pretty much like my ruler and my cloth, and the first question says, how would you charge the perspex ruler? They're not asking, how would you make it positive or negative? It doesn't really matter. But nice and simple, you're going to use the process of friction. Okay, friction, which means you're going to rub the ruler with the rod. Now, B, this is so important, grade 10s. I need you to get the, the whole concept of how to write an explanation type question. It says, explain how the ruler becomes charged in terms of charge, okay? In other words, you can't just say, well, when I rub it, it gets a charge. No, 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 no. When you rub it, the friction causes electrons to move, thus it gains a charge. Okay, so it becomes a charge. Very important here, okay? So you got that? The friction causes the electrons to move and a charge is gained. I'm not worried about whether you understand whether the cloth becomes negative and the rod becomes... We don't care. We need to know that you understand that the friction causes the electrons to move, okay? Then, next question. How does the charged ruler attract small pieces of paper? Well, this is interesting because I didn't really spend too much time on that. This is what you need to recognize. And maybe drawing this diagram is a good idea. If we have my ruler, and let's say it becomes positively charged. Okay. And then we have our little pieces of paper. To the, okay. As the ruler comes towards the pieces of the paper, the electrons in the pieces of the paper go, oh, yeah, 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 like the, like the positively charged rod. Very excited. They get attracted to the ruler because they move to the top of the piece of paper. The positive charges move down to the bottom of the piece of paper, and the pieces of paper get attracted to the ruler. Okay? In fact, you can pick up very, very small pieces of paper. It's quite, like I said, it's an interesting little test to do on your own. Okay, so what do they want in there is that when the ruler comes towards the paper, the charge in the paper moves to counteract the ruler's charge. Okay, by counteracting the ruler's charge, they, they become attracted, excuse me, to the ruler, and the ruler and the piece of paper are attracted to each other. This one's a little more difficult to just answer in general without actually having a mark allocation. But please be careful with a question like this, great teens. You don't want to be... Sp this is not an essay, okay? This would be worth three or four marks. And what we're looking for is for you to realize that as the ruler or the rod comes towards the paper, the charge in the paper moves, okay? 
and that allows the paper to get attracted. Drawing diagrams isn't a bad idea, but please remember your teachers are not mind readers. So if you draw a diagram like this, make sure there's an explanation to follow it. Okay? My learners know this. They can draw this, but it means nothing unless I know they understand the process. Okay? Explanation questions can be a little more difficult. Right. Next one. An uncharged hollow metal sphere is placed on an insulating stand. Grade 10s. Insulating stand simply means that all the charge sits on the sphere. They're saying to you that the charge cannot move. That's all it means, okay? A positively charged rod is brought up to touch the hollow metal sphere at point P as shown. So we showed in the diagram, and it's then moved away. Now think about what's happening here. I have two objects, both able to carry a charge. We spoke about the conservation of charge. What's actually going to happen here is that positive charge is going to make electrons move from the sphere to the rod because it's going to try and neutralize the rod because that's what it wants to do, which then means that the overall positive charge gets distributed between the two of these s evenly, okay? Now, this is where I need you to be careful. I said to you right at the beginning, protons cannot move, all right? We never have positive charge moving. When I talk about positive charge being evenly distributed, I'm not saying the positive charge is moved. I'm saying that because of the movement of the electrons, overall, the whole system becomes positive. Okay, and remember what's actually happening is the electrons are moving around, but it's still positively charged overall because I have too few electrons. Very important. Question says, where is the excess charge distributed on the sphere after the rod has been removed? So we take the rod away, and that means this sphere will be left with an overall positive charge. But that wasn't the question. The question wasn't whether it's going to be positive or negative. It says, where is the charge? Remember, we spoke about that right at the, be right at the beginning of the quantization of charge. The charge is going to be distributed on the outer surface of the sphere. So it's going to be on the outer surface. And remember, it's going to be distributed evenly. What am I looking for? Even distribution on the outer surface. Didn't ask you what the charge will be, didn't ask you if it's going to be positive or negative. I just asked you where it will be. Okay? Nice and easy. Third example. Okay, now we're starting to get into the maths part of things. And we go, don't like this so much. So, an object has an excess charge, brilliant, of minus 8 comma 6 times 10 to the minus 18. That means Q is minus 8 comma 6 times 10 to the minus 18. How many excess electrons does it have? So they want N. I'm hoping right now you're going, oh, no, no, I know how to do this. I know how to do this. We need to use our equation that we learned earlier. We had 2, Q nu equals Q1 plus Q2 over 2, or Q equals NQE. That means we need to remember that QE is minus 1, 6 times 10 to the minus 19. I've kept the minus here because I'm dealing with an excess of electrons. So I've got, if I've got a minus charge, I need to divide by minus because I can't have a negative number of electrons. Okay? So let's, from here we go, well, Q equals NQE. And, okay, 
minus 8 comma 6 and in 1 comma 6 times 10 to the minus 19. Now we need n on its own, so we're going to divide both sides. I'm going to show you the maths. We're going to divide both sides by minus 1 comma 6. Oh, sorry, that's 18, not 19. Now, I'm hoping you're doing this on your calculators, and some of you are looking at your calculators going, there's a problem here, because, and this has been done deliberately, I want, I want to show you something. We get 53,75. Now, what that means, the 53 is not, not the problem, okay? 53 electrons is not an issue. It's the 0.75 grade 10s. You cannot. Now, that means there's a problem with this question. And in a test or an exam, you need to be saying to yourself, there's an issue. And go back and check whether you got the right answer, okay? You must, you must, you must, you must. Because this answer tells me that I've got a two-thirds, no, three-quarters, sorry, 0 0.75, of an electron. How do you take an electron and cut it so you only have three-quarters of it? You can't, okay? Your number of electrons must be a whole number. You also cannot round this off to 54, all right? This value, minus 8, 6 times 10 to the minus 18, is not possible. That's what the quantization of charge means. There are only certain values that are possible. This is not one of them. Okay, and what that means is there's actually a typing error. Now, this I did deliberately because I needed to show you that you've got to check these answers really, really, really carefully, grade, not, grade tens, okay? Please be careful here. You cannot get a fraction at all. What this should have been was minus 9, 6. Because if I do the equation again, okay, and I use 9, 6. So I'm going to do exactly the same. So these are what happens when you get typos. And you know what? It happens. It's the way it is, and we're all human. And this, your textbooks do exactly the same, I'm afraid. And often it happens in tests and exams. So... Please, it's just one of those things. We're now going to divide by nine, one, one comma six, sorry, on both sides. Okay, that should be minus, and now we get sixty. Now sixty makes sense. Sixty makes a lot of sense. Okay, it's a whole number. As a teacher, all right, I know that it's probably also not a great number. Because generally, when we talk about charge within the context of electrostatics, we're talking about charges even smaller than this, so you should usually get an answer of 5 or 6 or 7. Tens and hundreds, not a good idea, but it's a whole number, so I'm okay with that, all right? Small little error in typing. An 8 was typed as, a 9 was typed as an 8, makes a big difference in the question, okay? But please, I needed you to see that, that you cannot get a fraction, okay? Okay, so now we've got a great question to end off for today. Two identical metal spheres. What we're going to do, grade tens, is I'm going to draw a little picture as we go along. I find pictures really, really helpful. You don't have to. I just find it easier to work through the question and what they're asking me and to try and put it all into context because sometimes we battle to understand the question. So. Two metal spheres, so let's draw two, okay, we'll make, okay, no, I didn't, yep, there's one, okay, there's my first metal sphere, let's just move it, there we go, metal sphere one, and let's put another one, okay, two metal spheres, two identical metal spheres have different charges. Sphere one, so let's call this one, has a charge of minus 4,8 times 10, to the minus 18 coulombs. Sphere 2 has 30 excess protons. 
So that means sphere 2 is positive. Okay? Protons. It's positive. If the two spheres are brought into contact and then separated. Okay, so we bring them into contact. We then separate them. What charge will each have? So my question is charge. Deal with equation one, the first part of the question. It's two questions, deal with the first one. What charge will each have? Well, that means I need to use Q nu equals Q1 plus Q2 over 2. Great. I have Q1. Small problem. Don't have Q2. That means first thing I have to do is work out what is the charge on sphere 2. So let's work that out. Now I want you to see I'm going to put the, I'm going to put for sphere 2, Q2 is in QE. Okay? We know N now because it is 30. Positively charged because it's protons. QE is the same for protons. So now instead of putting minus 1, comma 6, and I'm going to be plus 1, comma 6. And we take out our calculators and we get 4, comma 8 times 10 to the minus, oh, that's terrible, to the minus 18 coulombs. Great, I have sphere 2. Now, I can go into the next part of the question, which was what is the charge on each of the spheres as they come into contact? So, Q nu is Q1 plus Q2 over 2. Q1 Let's look back, was minus 4, 8 times 10 to the minus 18. Q2, we just worked it out as plus. Divided by 2, and I'm hoping you all see this, that I'm actually having the plus and minus of exactly the same number, which means it's 0. Another big important thing that you need to remember, great team, please don't leave your units out because you got an answer of zero. Okay, it's still, it means something for us. Zero coulombs, there is no charge. Okay, so make sure you've got the units. Now, this is actually quite nice because it means for us that it neutralized each other. Okay, everyone happy? So, if I had to really go into it, that means this has got 30 excess electrons. If they added 30 excess protons, this has got 30 excess electrons. And what has actually happened is when these two spheres touched, all of the electrons from sphere 1 went onto sphere 2 to go and neutralize it, okay? Now, I'm just going to take this off so we can see the next part of the question. Nat says to you, how many electrons or protons does this correspond to? That this is the charge you've just calculated. Zero coulombs. It's no charge. There is no charge, which means there is no excess of electrons or protons. The two spheres are now neutral. Okay? I could ask and this would be a great question, is I could extend this and go, okay, how, what, describe the transfer of charge. What actually happened? You could go back, and that means I would want you to say to me, well, the electrons from sphere one are transferred to sphere two to, to make the sphere two neutral. Okay, it tries to make it neutral. When the charge gets evenly distributed, the electrons move. Okay, please be careful here because I know I've seen this over and over again. When I get told, the protons move and the protons can't move. Okay, the electrons move and the electrons want to make them both neutral. Nice and simple. So what have we 
done because we've almost come to the end, okay? Remember, we've packed a lot into, into, into today's um, lesson. We looked at magnetism, realizing magnetism is everywhere. It's a magnetic field. Magnetic field is where objects that, have, that are magnetic in nature experience a non-contact force, okay? Remember, we get magnetic fields and magnets when the domains inside the magnets become aligned. Okay, and we get a north and a south pole. And I just want to add one quick thing in there quickly, while just as end, because I forgot to tell you this in the beginning, is with the magnets, please understand that if I break my magnets in half over here, that doesn't make this blue part my south and this whole red part north. No, I will then get, if I break it in half, a south and a north. If I break it again, a south and a north. I break it again, I can keep doing that. That's what the domains actually tell me. Is that when we get all our domains in a row, we have north, lots of norths and souths. Okay? And I can break up my magnets as many times as possible to get all those little domains if I really, really wanted to, though I'm not sure why you would. Okay. Like poles attract. Sorry, like poles repel, unlike poles attract. And remember, we have a magnetic field, which is drawn that goes from north to south. And then we looked at a couple of the applications like the aurora and the magnetic magnetosphere of the earth which is always so great. We then went on to electrostatics looking at charge. Okay, charge being stacked, um, charge that's not moving. Remember we can charge an object through rubbing, through friction or by induction friction probably being a little more important. We get positive charges because there is a um, excess of protons, which means our object has lost electrons. We get a negative charge because we have an excess of electrons because our object has gained electrons. Remembering that only the electrons move. This is really, really, really important, okay? We also looked at the distribution of charge, realizing that on an object, the charge will always distribute itself to the outside of the object, never to the inside, hollow or not which also means that when two charged objects come into contact with each other, the charge will distribute itself around both objects together, which then means that we can actually take two objects that have got different charges, put them together, and now they will both have the same charge if I separate them. Okay, and we use the equation that Q nu equals Q1 plus Q2 over 2. We also looked at the concept of the fact that charge is quantum quantized, okay, quantized meaning that it comes in packets, that it can only come in packets of those units, and that happens to be 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. If it's an electron, then it's minus 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. If it's a proton, then it's plus 1,6 times 10 to the ni minus 19. And then we did that nice question where we realized that we have, we can't get half an electron or a quarter of an electron or 0.75 of an electron. It's got to be in whole numbers. Okay, and remember, whenever we describe the movement of charge, it's always the electrons that move. Never, never, never the proton. Okay, we have covered a lot of content today, guys. I really hope that's brought some clarity and made it a bit easier for you. Summarized it all. This comes down to practice, 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 including the explanation type questions, okay? And that is where I'm going to end for today. So I'm going to say goodbye and I'll see you again next time.